Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ramadan Mubarak. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Healthy Muslim in Ramadan. Our talks on how to survive Ramadan a wiser and better person. I want to talk now about the circumstances and illnesses that are incompatible with fasting. Fasting is incumbent on any healthy person, and I've explained what a serious, serious ruling this is. Not just as a negative that you'll be in, you're not really a Muslim if you don't fast, but the benefit that you will get from it. However, we must also understand that there are circumstances where we cannot fast. I explained that the first thing you do when you break when you break your fast and when you start your fast is to make your niyyah, your intention. And without intention, the fast is an exercise of your physiology and your ego, but it's not a prayer to Allah. So you have to be capable of making an intention. Sadly, some people, their burden as a human is that they have disorders of the mind. This may be a disorder from very early childhood that they lack the competence, they lack the, lack the intelligence to form an understanding of who Allah is or what fasting might be about. We must do their praying for them, but also remember that because they cannot make an intention, they also cannot sin. So actually, these are very beautiful people. These are angels that we have to protect. And fasting is not incumbent on them because they don't have any sins. People might have, have been given a normal intelligence in their youth, but something has gone wrong with the biochemistry of their brain in a way that we would call, or in the old physician called, insanity. We have a slightly more user-friendly term, which might be mental illness, and it incorporates a very wide field. There will be people who are hallucinating and who have really no idea what Ramadan or God or anything would be about. So clearly they would be incapable of fasting. There are also people who have perhaps an ability to understand Allah, but such a mercurial and fluctuating state of mind from mania to deep depression that on a day-to-day -day basis, they may need to review their niya. On a good day, they might try to fast, and they'll make the niya, and inshallah, they'll be able to fast. On other days, they won't. The flexibility of fasting is not that you make the niya to fast for 30 days. You make the niya to fast for today. And with Allah's mercy and help, you'll be able to. So the, the decision that you have a lack of competence for fasting in terms of intention is not an absolute. It might be an absolute and it might be a relative thing. In the same way, we must look for people, the, the beautiful people in our protection. You know, of course, I'm referring to children. Children come very quickly to an understanding of Allah. I would like to say that children are naturally spiritual. A child early on absolutely knows about heaven and about the spirits in the sky. They understand it more than we do as we cloud our hearts with our preoccupations with pleasure and our own ego. But children come to their own understanding 
of fasting in their own way. It is up to parents very sensitively to help their children to understand the benefits of fasting, to understand fasting as a positive thing to do, not as a punishment, and certainly not to punish them because they were unable to fast. They're on a learning curve and we must show them compassion. But they are learning and that means that they can inter be introduced early, even for a short fast. They can fast an hour, they can fast two hours. Little introductions like this to give them the taste of the sweetness of fasting and the benefits. And you can praise them for having done so much. And then the child will say, I want to do another hour, I want to do another hour. And it'll be like a carrot that they'll get there. I know I'm talking to women who have children and I'm sure you're better than anything that I have advised you to do. But we all love the sweetness of the children in our charge. And by the time they've reached teenage years, they must be longing, longing to do a full fast because you must have explained to them by then how wonderful this month is and the sense of achievement that they will get in that month. One of the things that I love about Eid Day is I'm a fat cat and a lazy old lady and I love driving my car to the mosque and you see the families in their best clothes and the children wearing really glamorous outfits and the pride with which they're walking to the mosque on Eid day and I bet they've been made to fast even for half an hour a day um, but they've been given the sense that the way that I watch them walking I can see that their parents have introduced them to the sense of the pleasure of fasting and the pleasure of what Ramadan is about. In fasting, we are challenging the physiology of the body. And in the normal physiology of the body, there are situations where you may not fast. And it is clearly in the Quran and in Hadith indicated those situations. Menstruating women, women who are pregnant, women who are breastfeeding. These are times when your body is already under stress and it's already a benefit for you. You do not need to fast at these times. I would like to add in the post-operative patient. They may not be seen to be ill, but it takes six weeks to three months to recover from major surgery or to recover from a fracture. If you're trying to fast, your fracture won't heal properly. And with humility, you must understand that your body has rights over you. And you must ask the guidance of your imam, your ulama, what your particular situation is. But take advice from your doctor and take advice from your ulama before you make your decision. There may be circumstances which also can make it incumbent on you not to fast. If you're traveling, you don't have to fast. Then look at the thick of what is meant by traveling. These rules were set out for people who are traveling by camel or horseback or walking. And they were traveling long distances in the sun. They would get very thirsty and very weak without water. If you're traveling in a Mercedes-Benz across London, that doesn't count as traveling. <laughs> so what we're talking about here is a traveling that would clearly challenge your ability to fast. I was called on an emergency where I had to travel at the end of my fasting days to drive for about two hours. I knew I would not drive safely, so I made my knee out to break my fast because it was important to go to the emergency as a physician. This person had rights to my care for them. And I made my knee out to break my fast in order that I would not drive unsafely 
and uh, perhaps cause harm to other people. So traveling, even if you have to make a new decision to travel in the middle of a fasting day, traveling, you are allowed to break your fast and do it at another time. You might have a dangerous job or a responsible job in which if you are weak towards the end of a fast, you must not put other people or yourself in harm's way. What's interesting about fasting is as you do it a lot, you get actually quite good at it in the sense that a surgeon I know who regularly does extremely complex operations which can take six hours or longer. And he regularly does these operations in Ramadan and he fasts. And I asked him, do you worry that during the operation you're going to somehow feel weak and you're, you might make a mistake, your vision might not be as clear as it should be and so on. And he smiled and he said, I don't understand it. But he said, actually, I'm more attentive. And I'm very careful before a long operation, other than fasting, to drink, but not to eat, because food clouds the mind. But he's a trained faster, and that's a different situation. We'll be having a break now, but please come back because I'd like to talk to you about the illnesses that might stop you fasting. Thank you. We were talking about the conditions that make it impossible for you to fast during the month of Ramadan or at other times. Obviously, any acute illness of a severity which requires you to take medicine or which would make it harmful to you not to have water and food. Any acute illness, whatever kind, means that you may not fast. You are not expected to harm your body by fasting and you will get the benefit of the fast because it was intended for you. However, there are chronic illnesses which are quite subtle and you may be able to live a very full life, to go to work, and people would think you're absolutely normal, absolutely strong, and why on earth can't you do the month, fast for the month of Ramadan? But you should think very carefully whether it's wise or safe for you to do so. In the fast, two things happen. First of all, water balance. During the fast, you become dehydrated and your blood pressure falls. There are certain conditions in human physiology in which water balance is not achieved by people who attempt to fast or who do not have access to water. And these people without access to water can die and can get sick very quickly. The kidney is the organ in the body that is responsible for keeping fluid in the body. And I think anybody who's fasted knows this, because towards the end of your fast, you will be aware of two areas of warmth on the sides of your back, which you could fry an egg on. You could literally put your hand over your back and feel the heat radiating out of your kidneys as they are desperately working to make sure that there is no um, that there is no water passing through the kidneys and being wasted because your body wants all of it and it's hard work so be kind to your kidneys that useful things to have if you want to fast for Ramadan. Um, the, the point of kidney disease is that it can't do that. So where when you break your fast, you're amazed that you don't need to go to the toilet to pass any water because no water's actually been formed through the day. 
a person with kidney disease, even though the water has not been coming in, they, the kidneys are unable to concentrate at all. So urine flows. As a result, the body becomes very quickly dehydrated. There are other conditions which achieve the same thing, which are rather more complicated. If there are any medical students out there, you'll get brownie points for knowing what they are, have some thinking. One would be inappropriate ADH secretion. Another would be diabetes insipidus. Well done. You, you're ahead of me. Um, so there are conditions where your doctor will say to you, I'm sorry, you cannot fast at all because you will get very sick halfway through the day. The other point of water is that when you become dehydrated, your blood pressure drops a bit. For most people, dropping their blood pressure is a good thing. But there are neurological conditions where when you stand up, your blood pressure drops. Some of these are quite rare, some of these quite common. The common one uh, would be a condition associated, one of the complications of diabetes. And literally, you can have a very healthy, normal blood pressure. You stand up and it literally tanks. Now, if you're dehydrated at the same time, you could very easily faint. So a person with this complication of diabetes may not fast. There are people who might have problems with their throat. This isn't actually in the textbooks of Islamic medicine that I've read. And it could be that these weren't common conditions in those days. But we have people who've had radiotherapy for throat cancer. And they end up with no saliva, none at all. Well, towards the end of the day, you've got very little, but you've got some when you're fasting. If you have none at all, by the end of the day, you could be harming the tissues of your throat, which will become excessively dry, will split and become inflamed. And in this situation, again, you must ask your doctor, ask your ulema, whether it's wise for you to fast. There are conditions where the same thing happens, either because of tumours of the salivary glands or a condition called Sjogren's syndrome, where the salivary glands aren't working and aren't producing saliva. In these situations, people have to sip water all day. You'll certainly know of the condition yourself. You won't have to have, ask your doctor whether you've got it. You'll know you have it. Um, and in my opinion, these people should think very carefully whether it's in their interest to fast. It's their choice, though. They might wish to try, but they must always, we must know that the fasting should not be intended to harm us. At the end of the day, we must treasure our bodies because they're a great gift from Allah, and we must not harm them. People who have blood pressure medicines might also be in a special case because some blood pressure medicines contain an element which tell the kidneys to get rid of water. You might like to ask your doctor to give you a different medicine during Ramadan so that that part of your blood pressure medicine is not included. You can take the other one safely then do your fasting, it will certainly help your blood pressure. Um, but this is again a relative situation where you need to discuss with your doctor, I'm approaching Ramadan, please adjust my medication for me. And I'm glad to say that in England, and even in the United States of America, God bless you, um, doctors are being taught now about how to advise Muslim patients on healthy fasting. It's an important thing for doctors to know about. The second thing that you're not having in Ramadan is food. Some people have a problem 
going from moment to moment without food. They're not good at maintaining a level of their blood sugar. Um, the people, obviously, most obviously with this problem would be people called diabetics. And there are various kinds of diabetes, from very mild, people who are slightly overweight, and because of the gene for diabetes, this overweight is associated with excess sugar. For them, fasting is a great benefit, and they should certainly not regard their form of diabetes as a reason not to fast. On the contrary, for this form of diabetic, Ramadan is a time to really understand your relationship with food and how you can learn from Ramadan how to be a healthier diabetic. Some diabetics need to take regular medication and your doctor can adjust this medication to allow you to fast. Having said that, there will be some diabetics for whom this is not possible. These are the diabetics who have completely run out of insulin and they require insulin injections. Although we're helping some diabetics, others have to have continuous injections. Now there's a school of Fich which is beginning to think that there might be some situation where a patient can have their injection before the fast and at the end of the fast, providing their form of diabetes allows them to have a steady blood sugar through their fasting without any supplemental medication. If that's not possible, you may not fast. But there's a great deal of skill in physicians who can allow you to fast with health, even with medication. So get Muslim-friendly physicians. I look forward to seeing you again to further explore Ramadan. Please come back tomorrow.